Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Macmillan English Hub in focus event for teachers in schools, eh, escuelas oficiales all around Spain. My name is Louise Connolly. I'm the events and teacher training manager at Macmillan Education. And I would really like to thank you for joining us here this morning. I know that this is a very busy time of year for you. There is a lot on, you have a lot on your plate. So it's really lovely to have you here and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to explain a couple of things about how the event is going to work today. Um, during the main talk uh, with Ethan Mansour, you will have the opportunity to interact with Ethan. He will launch a couple of polls or have your says. These are interactions where you have the opportunity to give your opinion. These will appear as a button on your screen. And for the poll, all you have to do is tick the correct answer for you. And with the have your say, which is an open-ended question, write a short answer, okay? And then um, at the end of Ethan's talk, we're going to open a space for questions and answers. Now you have a button on your screen, which is Q&A. You can actually start writing questions, sending in questions and comments from the beginning of Ethan's talk. And I would encourage you to do that because you may have a question that occurs to you that if you don't write it immediately, you might forget at the end. So please do use the Q&A button. At the end of the event, we'll also launch a survey monkey. This is a questionnaire. We want to get your opinion. It's really important. We value it because it will actually help us to improve our ongoing teacher training program and events program. We want to get feedback on how the event has gone and also suggestions for future teacher training sessions and events um, and other questions as well. It won't take you very long, a couple of minutes. So please do complete that SurveyMonkey questionnaire. Okay, all of that aside, the most important part, I want to welcome our speaker on screen. Welcome, Ethan. Thank you for joining us. How are you? Um, fine, how are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Ethan is an ELT, an English language teacher and author, and he has a particular, a real keen interest in mediation. Yeah, I think for some years now, Ethan, and you've done a lot of work on this, on this subject. And also, I believe that you have written mediation tasks, exam tasks for the Spanish Ministry of Education. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Fantastic. OK, so Ethan has a lot of experience on this topic. And so we invited Ethan uh, to explore this topic with all of us here today. And in particular, the question of mediating um, tasks, mediating texts rather, and developing and so developing really key skills for life because we know that mediation is something that actually directly affects all our lives and in the case of our students as well and these are transferable skills to real life situations okay so over to you Ethan okay well thank you Louise thanks for that nice introduction uh, so I'm just going to go over to my slides uh, yeah, so um, as we said, uh, we'll be focusing on uh, mediation, but um, with a specific focus on sort of why why it's good to teach mediation, why it's a, a really valuable thing uh, that we're doing in our classes. So um, just to let you know kind of what the plan is for today. Uh, so we'll start by looking at three types of text mediation. Um, and I'll be sort of talking about why uh, maybe it's good to not to think about mediation as sort of one thing, but that um, there's sort of it's good to think about sort of different types of, of mediation um, because that can help us kind of teach it better and um, help us de develop our student skills related to each type of, of mediation we're working with. And then, um, and then we'll sort of the second part of it uh, will be sort of a collection of uh, practical ideas uh, for uh, adding sort of more text mediation um, to your lessons 
And I'll be giving you some ideas for sort of small tweaks that you can make to classroom activities uh, or, or sort of um, sort of texts, particularly in, in course books. Um, uh, and I'll be using examples, of course, from uh, Macmillan's uh, English Hub uh, series for that. So um, one thing I wanted to just start with, though, um, was uh, just a, a little kind of a, a little bit of a history uh, of mediation, um, because I think sort of all of you in the EOIs have have come a long way um, in the last few years. Um, obviously, uh, when mediation was um, introduced in um, 2017, 2018, um, nobody, very few people had really ever taught it before and didn't really understand it necessarily, uh, even what it was. Um, I was certainly one of those people. Um, but um, so very quickly, um, we started to sort of get, get, um, get our, find our feet with mediation. Um, and, um, you know, at first it was, it was sort of a process of trying to understand just what it was in order, for, in order to um, figure out how to teach it. And, um, yeah, uh, for example, Macmillan gave uh, a nice webinar in 2020 called Linguistic Mediation, um, What Does This Mean for Our Classes? And I think that's sort of, to me, I, I watched this one recently and it sort of reflected kind of how we all felt at the beginning. Um, we weren't sure what it was. And so this, this uh, webinar, uh, we really sort of went into detail sort of describing what mediation was um, and how it was sort of defined within this uh, very important document, uh, the CFR, the Companion Volume. And um, <coughs> so, yeah, in 2020, you know, we're still sort of getting, finding our field mediation. But, you know, after a year, you know, we've, we've all been teaching mediation for longer. Uh, we're starting to develop uh, some teaching um, strategies and techniques related to this uh, sort of set of skills and uh, yeah and I think that's sort of reflected in, in sort of the next webinar that, that mediation that um, Macmillan organized about mediation uh, in 2001 um, with uh, Monica Arredondo Arias uh, who gave a very nice session uh, full of lots of practical ideas from her own experience and uh, sort of creating um, uh, mediation activities for her students and sort of helping them develop and uh, the skills and she also talked a lot about um, so how we can assess it in class and sort of a, a useful way to help our, you know, make sure our students are really making progress um, with, uh, with, their, with their mediation skills. And um, so, and that kind of brings us to today uh, in 2020 to this, this particular webinar. Um, and it's about to, to why mediation is important, why, why it's a good thing. Um, because I think that sort of we've come a long way and, um, you know, I think we, we sort of, we know what we're doing a little bit more now with mediation. I just want to focus in this webinar on, on why uh, I think it's, uh, mediation is so valuable, um, why the skills that we're helping uh, our students develop are, are so transferable and uh, sort of so valuable um, outside the classroom in their real lives. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to take a, a minute and say that uh, I really admire all the teachers in the, in the official language schools uh, because uh, you guys have come a long way with mediation. Um, you've gotten much better at teaching it. And uh, I was just going to mention that um, uh, earlier in the year, uh, I participated in um, this sort of European um, conference related to mediation. And I got to talk to some of the participants and uh, the people organizing it. And, and they were all saying how, how much of an, in, um, how much inspiration that they've gotten from Spain. Um, because Spain uh, introduced mediation very quickly after the release of the companion volume. So Spain was sort of well ahead of most other European countries when it came to mediation. And um, they were just saying that, um, yeah, they really admired uh, the work that um, the Spanish teachers have been doing with mediation and that, um, yeah, you've been a source of inspiration for, particularly I was talking to, to teachers in Poland and they were saying that they were um, sort of excited to start sort of doing uh, some things that you've already been doing for, for many years. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, just to sort of pass that on. Um, yeah, just to give you a little bit of a background too about kind of my journey with mediation, because I think it's a little bit different than yours. Um, so I'm not a teacher in the US, um, but I am very interested in mediation, and I've actually been uh, interested in it some, from the very start. Um, I actually started, uh, believe it or not, sort of doing mediation stuff with my students in 2017, uh, because I actually got an advanced copy of this CFR document um, from uh, a colleague who works at um, one of these big language testing organizations. Uh, and I, and I, I saw this huge new section about mediation. I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Uh, so it was something I, I just kind of came across in that way and um, started to, uh, uh, sort of trying things out in class of creating some of my own materials. Um, and that sort of led me to, to write some articles about mediation and give some conference talks. And um, 
that led to some 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 writing with the Spanish Ministry of Education. Um, this, of course, related to the UIs, um, specifically for for that's English. Um, and uh, <laughs> sort of that experience uh, uh, sort of kind of laid the ground for sort of more writing work uh, related to mediation. And I've, I've sort of gone on to, to publish a whole book about mediation called uh, Activities for Mediation. Uh, so, uh, uh, so mediation is, is just something that uh, I've kind of become very enthusiastic about. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to sort of uh, share my story, um, sort of how, how I ended up here <laughs> uh, giving this webinar. So um, with that, uh, we're just going to move on um, to a poll. Um, so I'm very, I'm very excited about mediation. Um, but I was just curious sort of what your students think about mediation, sort of how, how interesting and how useful uh, do they think um, mediation is. Um, so uh, we're going to open a poll now. And um, you're going to be able to uh, just sort of choose one of these options, sort of just thinking about your students generally. How do they feel about mediation? Okay, so the poll is open, Great. and people can choose their answer. We'll give them a couple of seconds. The answers are coming in. The question is, how useful and interesting do your students find text mediation activities? Extremely, very, quite, not very, not at all. We're getting lots of answers in, and it yeah. seems that there is a majority. I think we can close this on a majority saying, very useful and interesting, followed by, quite useful and interesting okay actually it's changing again it's quite interesting yeah. to look at these bars the way they go up and down mm -hmm. um, quite quickly. um okay actually i told i i i go back on what i said <laughs> let's close it at quite useful and interesting followed by very useful and interesting followed by not very useful or interesting. However, the majority is 50% on quite, 25% on very, 17% not very useful, and 8% extremely useful. Okay, thank you, everybody. Great, thanks for your participation, guys. Um, so it looks like uh, your students do indeed um, find uh, mediation uh, useful and interesting, and that's, that's great to hear. Um, obviously, I think it's extremely useful and interesting. It, it would be nice if every student felt that way, but uh, maybe that's not realistic. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll be sort of talking uh, sort of a little bit about why um, I think mediation is uh, very useful, uh, extremely useful, and uh, yeah, we'll be having a look at um, some reasons for that. So um, basically, now I'm going to move on and talk about some types of mediation. Um, because as I said, mediation is not just one thing. It's sort of or different types of it. Uh, and we'll be focusing on uh, text mediation in particular. And uh, as, as all of you know, of course, um, a text mediation task always starts with a text, right? Um, and that text is some one that a person receives. So they're using sort of receptive skills. They're either listening, um, watching maybe a video, um, or reading a text. And then, of course, they're, they're passing that. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> They're passing some information, some relevant information uh, from that text to, to another person. So they're also using productive skills. Um, and they could be, uh, for example, writing an email to somebody, um, or, or they might be writing a text message, uh, or uh, leaving a voicemail, uh, of course, or a voice message, um, or it could actually be a conversation as well. I think that's kind of important to point out that um, there actually could be a, sort of a conversation involved. Uh, so uh, the person who's receiving the information, they could be sort of asking questions, asking for more information and so on. Um, so, and uh, of course, all of you know all this, but um, uh, just to talk about some terminology, uh, I'll be using uh, the, word, the, the term source text to talk about sort of the first part um, where it's uh, receptive and then the target text for sort of the productive side. I'm sure most of you are probably using those same terms, but I uh, just thought I would mention. Um, yeah, and I just want to say that uh, so in terms of why I think mediation is so interesting and useful, uh, I think the first thing is that I really like the integration of skills. I think that's great. Um, it's a way of sort of bringing the skills together in a very natural way. Um, you know, this is something we do a lot. We sort of read something and then we tell someone else about it. Um, 
It's a very natural way of integrating skills in class. So a mediation lesson or a mediation task, uh, it's not just uh, about reading or not just about speaking. Um, it's sort of lots of skills uh, together, uh, which I really like. Um, and um, yeah, another thing I like about mediation as it's um, sort of defined in the CFR is it sort of opens the door to uh, cross-linguistic mediation uh, or interlinguistic mediation, sort of depending on what you want to call it. Um, where, for example, the source text is in another language, uh, typically in Spanish, but uh, you know, it of course depends on the context. Uh, if you're in Greece, it could be in Greek, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, for me, that was a, a sort of a very uh, interesting source of inspiration because I had never really done that before in class. I had never sort of gotten students to, to do something, uh, sort of a receptive task, essentially in Spanish, and then a productive task in English before. Um, and it was, a, it was a nice source of inspiration for me in terms of, um, of trying new things in class. I think that's one, one nice thing about mediation as well. Um, and uh, just here, I wanted to make uh, one uh, note um, because I think that sometimes, um, so I've spoken to many uh, teachers in the U.S. Uh, been doing sort of training related, related to mediation. I think sometimes I find that there's a, a little bit of a misconception about sort of what can count as mediation um, because I think that um, in general, teachers tend to sort of focus on, on a barrier to communication, which creates the need for mediation. Um, so, for example, if the source text is in Spanish and then you're sort of telling someone in English about it, there's a natural barrier there that's, that's sort of creating a real need for mediation um, because <coughs> the person you're explaining to may not understand Spanish. Um, or there might be a cultural barrier that's also sort of creating the, the real need for mediation. Um, maybe there's sort of a cultural thing that someone just doesn't understand because they don't belong to that culture. Um, but I think it's worth noting uh, that according to the CFR, according to this document that we started with, uh, the companion volume, um, mediation often happens uh, simply because of a lack of information. Um, so uh, this happens a lot in real life when you think about it. Um, for example, maybe I read a news story and then I explain it to somebody else and that person could just go read the news story. They're perfectly able to do that, but in the moment I end up sort of mediating uh, for them. I sort of I relay some, some specific information or I sort of summarize um, that article for them. Um, and that's, that's a natural uh, sort of um, uh, context for mediation. And even though there really is no linguistic or cultural barrier there, uh, we're still doing mediation. We're still using that same sort of set of skills of paraphrasing, summarizing um, that we're using when there is a cultural or, or linguistic barrier. Uh, so I think that, that that definitely counts as mediation as well, and we'll be looking at some tasks that involve um, really no linguistic or cultural barrier, but rather uh, this lack of information. So <coughs> let's talk about the types of mediation uh, that I want to focus on today. Uh, so the first one is called <coughs> relaying specific information. So uh, basically, this involves uh, finding uh, relevant pieces of information in this sort of source text over, uh, over here. And um, uh, one interesting thing about relaying specific information is that uh, it's related to this reading, um, uh, sort of reading skill of scanning uh, that I'm sure we're all familiar with. And uh, when you're scanning something, you don't actually have to read the whole text uh, and you don't actually have to understand the whole text, uh, interestingly. Uh, you really just have to find the information you're looking for. So when we're talking about relaying specific information, uh, we're often talking about sort of maybe uh, the time that something starts or the price of something, uh, or perhaps just uh, some, some relevant pieces of information uh, that we find that we think would be sort of relevant or, or useful for somebody else. So we sort of find them and then we sort of pass them on. That's the idea of uh, relaying specific information. And I think it's worth saying that in this type of task, actually the source text can actually be pretty long because uh, students don't actually have to read the whole thing necessarily. They just have to sort of find what they're looking for um, and uh, pass that on to somebody else. So um, to give you a, a, a specific example of this, um, this comes from um, the uh, Macmillan English Hub uh, series, uh, which I mentioned before, uh, which has uh, a lot of mediation resources uh, for, for, that was designed specifically for all of you in the UIs. Uh, to sort of meet your, your needs in terms of um, helping your students um, uh, develop uh, their mediation skills, um, because obviously uh, this is sort of widely tested in the, um, in the UIs. Um, yeah, so here uh, basically the situation is that um, uh, we have two friends, Linda and Tom, <coughs> they want to improve their Spanish, 
And of course, a good way of improving any language is to watch some TV in that language. Um, something we all sort of tell our students, right? That uh, it's it's good for them to watch some some TV in English um, if they can. But these 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 uh, two particular students, they they're trying to learn Spanish. Um, and uh, so what we have in this source text is uh, a series of sort of short extracts explaining, um, giving some basic information about some Spanish TV series. And of course, I think you'll find that um, because uh, they've given us very specific information about Tom and Linda, um, we know what we're looking for, essentially. So we need to find something related to mysteries or romantic comedies for Tom, and we need to find something related to action for Linda. And so we could sort of quickly scan that text and find uh, the, the series that we want. Um, and then um, once we've sort of found them, then we kind of think about how we could um, sort of su summarize them or paraphrase them. I think uh, one thing I actually was meant to mention earlier is that with, when, when we talk about relaying specific information, uh, sort of the mediation strategy we're, we're often using is paraphrasing. We're sort of taking a specific sort of sentence or a piece of information and uh, putting it into our own words uh, or, or making it sort of more accessible for the person that we're, we're passing it on to. Uh, we may in fact be translating, and that's the case here, this particular source text is, is in Spanish, so it would sort of involve paraphrasing and translating at the same time. So uh, that is uh, relaying specific information. And I think when you stop and think about it, uh, this is something we do all the time <laughs> when you think about it. Um, we do it when uh, we, for example, maybe we read a WhatsApp conversation and then we, we see some, some relevant information there that, that might be useful or something, we sort of quickly tell them about it. Um, or it might happen, for example, with an official document. Um, maybe uh, official documents in a language that we don't understand very well, um, or it's just complicated. Um, and we ask somebody to sort of help us, like, I can't find where it explains how to do something. So someone else looks at it and sort of finds that information is mediated to us. <coughs> so uh, in this uh, have you say activity, I would like to just do a little brainstorm with you. Um, what are some other um, sort of texts, source texts, um, that might contain specific information uh, that we might relate to to a friend, a specific sort of somebody, somebody we know? Okay, so the have your say is on your screen and all you need to do is, is write, well, the types of text. You don't need, need to write full sentences, just types of text. And I'm thinking, Ethan, of loads of examples because as you say, there are so many different types of text and mediation does affect so many areas in so many situations. But um, yeah. I'm not going to yeah, say, yeah. I'm tempted. It's very difficult not to say. <laughs> I want to say the answer, but I won't. I like, I I like news. I like news. That's definitely good. Yeah, like a specific uh, brochure. Yeah. That's a very good one. Yeah, because when you think about Absolutely. a brochure, it might contain a lot of information someone is not interested in, actually. But it might have a, a specific part that someone's very interested in, and you could sort of read it and, and tell them about it. Um, and we have uh, a recipe. Yes, I think that's definitely a good example too, right? Like, does this need salt? I'm not sure. <laughs> and you sort of look at the recipe quickly. Okay, yeah, yes, it does need salt. Um, so we pass that on to somebody. There's a and, contract uh, as well. There's a, a movie tra movie trailers, WhatsApp conversations. Mm -hmm. For example, in a movie trailer, maybe when, when the movie is actually gonna premiere, that could be a specific mm -hmm. relevant information. Um, yeah, I like contract. Contracts is great because, yeah, for example, like if you're if you're like me when I when I first moved to Spain, I didn't really know much Spanish, and uh, I, I definitely had to sign a mental contract that I didn't that couldn't read. Uh, it would have been very useful for somebody to be able to sort of answer specific questions about it. Sort of like, wait, so what happens if I'm late? You know, on my on one month, uh, you know, somebody could just quickly kind of find that for me and, and then. Uh, relay the information I need. Absolutely, I hear you. I've been in that situation myself. <laughs> um, somebody else is saying internet has a lot of different texts. You only have to type the specific topic you are looking for. Um, so as a source of text, the internet is very good. Um, yeah, sure. What else? Oh, um, exhibition, information about an, an exhibition. Absolutely, like or other types of events. Like 
Like, well, yeah, like, what kind of art is this? Like, what are we going to see? <laughs> and then so you could say, well, it's actually this specific type of art. Um, yeah, so I think we can uh, we can safely say this is a, a very common sort of, um, and uh, I think one thing I've done with my students is do this type of brainstorming. Students are very good at coming up with examples of this as well, as you might imagine. And it, for me, it's been a great source of information as, if, as a writer, as someone who sort of develops mediation materials. Um, it's given me lots of ideas uh, for how to, to, to create new tasks, new, new situations. Um, and I think it, when you do this type of brainstorming with students, it also does something else, which is uh, it sort of convinces them that mediation is in fact very useful <laughs> and very common. And that um, it is, it's, it's a good thing to get better at, essentially. OK, so I think we can kind of move on. Um, so we've looked at uh, the first type of uh, mediation. Um, uh, by the way, yeah, I had some, some examples for you. <coughs> Most of these you've actually come up with on your own, um, recipe, a catalog. Uh, so there's, there are a lot of different types of text um, that uh, sort of lend themselves to a relaying specific information type of um, activity. Um, because we're, we're just naturally, uh, we naturally relay specific information when we um, encounter this type of text. So uh, the second type of mediation that I want to talk about is called processing text. Uh, so this is, of course, still text mediation. We're still talking, starting with a text. Um, but this one's quite different um, because um, we have to actually relay basically the whole text. Um, we're, not, we're not just sort of looking at specific sections. Um, uh, we can't. Uh, uh, we can't avoid sort of reading the whole text. Um, and this type of mediation is much more closely related to uh, the reading skill of uh, sort of reading for detail or, or listening for detail, um, because we, we need to really understand um, the text. We need to understand sort of the main ideas, uh, the lines of argument at higher levels, of course. Um, and basically, the idea of this mediation is we're passing on those main ideas uh, or those uh, sort of arguments that the person's making that's sort of the point of the text. Uh, that's what we're passing on. And um, yeah, of course, we're, we're sort of, we could be doing this in a very similar way to relaying specific information. Um, but uh, sort of the, the skills involved are a bit different when you think about it. Um, instead of sort of scanning the text and finding things, um, we're reading the text and really under, trying to really understand it. And then we're thinking about, well, how can we summarize it? Um, summary is, is very closely related to processing text. Uh, so we're basically taking uh, a text and we're making it shorter, and we're also possibly adapting the language um, to make it sort of more easily accessible um, or clear, possibly, uh, to another person. And of course, uh, this could involve sort of translation as well. So you could be sort of translating and summarizing at, at the same time um, this type of task. So I think that um, we can uh, sort of safely say that this is a, a common thing that we have to do. Um, and um, it's sort of, again, it's sort of easy to think of examples of this. Um, a good uh, sort of sample task, again, this comes from the Macmillan English Hub series, is a B2 task. Um, so um, we have, in this case, uh, a friend who's interested in something. Um, they're interested in becoming a successful entrepreneur, in this case. And uh, we have an article about that topic uh, in Spanish, uh, again, in this particular task. And uh, in this case, we're going to be uh, writing an email to the front, sort of just briefly telling them um, some of the advice, uh, sort of summarizing uh, the main points uh, that we think is so we're going to be most relevant uh, to this particular person. Um, and you can see here that uh, we're doing sort of a written mediation task um, instead of a spoken one, uh, like the first one. Uh, but I, of course, this type of task needs to be done as a spoken mediation task as well. You can always adapt these a little bit if, um, if you think your students sort of would benefit from a little bit more practice with a spoken mediation task. Spoken mediation and re written mediation end up being um, quite similar, actually, at least on the receptive side. Um, and uh, the tasks themselves, I think, are easily sort of tweakable in the sense that you can uh, make it uh, one or the other, if you want. So um, this, uh, yeah, this is just one example from uh, Mac the Macmillan series. Um, but uh, yeah, again, we're sort of you can see how we're, we need to actually read the whole text and sort of process the whole text in this type of mediation. And um, uh, just to uh, sort of do the same uh, brainstorm activity again with this type of mediation, um, I think we can all think of sort of easy to easy sort of. Uh, examples for this. Um, so I, the situation that I've given you is a university student, um, and I want you to think about what source text they might be able, um, they might need to process um, for somebody else, uh, specifically a professor or another student in that context. Um, so I think uh, some examples, sort of obvious ones, would be a textbook, for example. 
um, if you were writing a paper maybe um, or, or talking to another classmate and you might sort of end up kind of summarizing one section of the book maybe a chapter or something uh, you might also do that with a lecture when you think about it. maybe if a, if a student didn't come to the lecture maybe you took notes and you could use those notes to sort of uh, pass on sort of the main ideas uh, that your, your teacher was your teacher was sort of covering that day in class so um, I'd like you to again uh, just uh, try to think of some other ideas um, in this specific context uh, for processing text okay so again the button is on your screen you have your say it's your moment to give your opinion and again type so sort of sources or text sources, but for a different situation, um, a university student might need to summarize something for their teacher, their professor, or another student. So let's see. Okay. The process, that's an interesting one. Yes. A discussion. I like that one. Yeah. If, if for example, you were doing a group project and maybe one of the students wasn't there or something, you might. Yeah, take some notes for them and uh, sort of explain what what we, what what went on in that group discussion. I like that. That's fine. Webinars, I like that. <laughs> That's a good one. And articles, but of course the submission process, the uni submission. Although it's not with the the professor or teacher, but the, the, you know that the, there are so many um, situations at university. It's not all academic. There's the um, technical yeah. side as well. Yeah, I was going to wait for that. I'll come on. Not. So I actually think that when you think about it, maybe a uni um, submission process, I think that might, it could in involve processing text, of course, but I think it might lend itself actually better to relaying specific information. You know, if some, there was something yeah. somebody didn't quite understand about the process and you could sort of go and find it and, and explain it to them. Um, yeah. So I think that might actually be more of a relaying specific information. But an academic article, definitely. Right, because that's something we have to do all the time at university. We have to look at different sources of information and sort of process those, those the, the most relevant uh, ideas in those texts and sort of collate them or, or bring them together in, in the form of an essay or, or a paper uh, for your teacher um, or your tutor or whoever's going to read it. Um, I think that's a, a great example of, of mediation that doesn't really involve sort of a cultural or linguistic um, uh, barrier necessarily, right? If the article was in Spanish, it certainly would, but, um, but students do this all the time, right? Like the teacher could go and read that academic article themselves, of course, but the, the student has kind of done the work, right? They've sort of taken the relevant idea from that study and they sort of put it in context uh, within, their, within their paper. Um, so let's look at other ones. Uh, documentary, I like that very much. Yes, research papers, yep. essays. Yeah, I mean, you could even be uh, finding some relevant um, information in a newspaper, of course, uh, related to the topic that you're writing about. Um, of course, it depends a lot on what you're studying at university, the type of thing that you would be. Yeah, the types of texts you would be asked to process. But, um, but yeah, I think that, yeah, this is another situation where it's, it's quite easy to think of um, real life situations where we're, we're asked to use this, exactly. this skill of mediation. So uh, yeah, these are all ones that you've, uh, you've already come up with. Um, yeah, I had added uh, academic conferences. So maybe you go and you sort of, yeah, you watch somebody present about something that you think would be, you know, particularly relevant to a colleague or something, and you sort of summarize it for them later and get them interested in it, hopefully. Maybe they want to find out more about it. Okay, so um, we've had a look at that one. So uh, I'm gonna finish with a third type of mediation, which is called explaining data. So uh, this one, of course, is still text mediation. We're still starting with the text, um, but in this case, it's specifically data. Uh, it's worth saying that um, there could be sort of some data uh, related um, things in, in a processing text. Maybe you're reading an academic article that includes graphs and stuff, so it's, it's possible there. But this one sort of focuses on the idea of basically taking numbers or sort of graphic information and turning that into verbal sort of language. So basically turning it into sort of spoken language or written language. Um, and that's sort of that's the mediation essentially you're sort of going from numbers or graphs or whatever and then you're sort of turning that into into words um, and uh, <coughs> I think what's interesting about this one is that um, 
it sort of involves both processing and relaying information when you think about it. Uh, so for example, if you're working with an infographic, um, you're probably more likely to relay specific information, you know, because in an infographic, things are already kind of condensed. Uh, things are already kind of summarized when you think about it. They're sort of like an inf a good infographic, at least, <laughs> uh, sort of puts information in a very clear, sort of simple, um, a simple sort of presentation. And so in that case, you're more often to sort of select information from that infographic. It would be sort of most useful or relevant to a particular sort of target audience, a particular person. However, uh, explaining data often includes sort of explanation. That's why it's called explaining data. Uh, because often there are sort of charts or graphs that uh, we could sort of put up if we were giving a presentation, but we would need to, we would need to sort of explain why they're important, uh, sort of understand, um, sort of explain the sort of the key takeaways from the data and stuff like that. Um, students do this, of course, at university, um, but um, uh, people who work at sort of offices, um, they, they give this type of presentation as well. It's uh, you know, obviously another sort of common everyday um, thing that we have to do. And um, this is, a, <coughs> this is a, a type of uh, task that um, you can sort of do in class to help students get better at this sort of set of skills. And um, I think what's interesting here is uh, you can see how there's sort of a text that's actually combined with uh, some visual information. I think that's quite typical um, in uh, sort of the mediation tasks that I've seen um, within the sort of Spanish language schools on, on the tests. And uh, I've, all, I've also written a number of, um, of tasks like this one because I think it often makes sense to combine sort of a short text, sort of informational text with some, some data. Um, so you're sort of working with two different sources of information instead of just an infographic or something, which of course is, just, is of course possible, but um, I think it's sort of natural, in fact, um, to sort of combine things a little bit. And I think having more than one source of information in a medium test is, is, is actually a good idea because that's, that's again, some, that's something we have to do often. We sort of relay information from different sources and kind of put it together. So uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, somebody, yeah, basically planning and, and delivering a short presentation on, on a topic, and they have to sort of select um, uh, the most relevant information from, from the infographic. Um, and as you can see here, this might involve a little bit of relaying uh, specific information, sort of finding things, but also some explanations, some, some processing as well, sort of, sort of putting things into context um, as well. So uh, one final brainstorm. I know I've made you do this twice already, but we'll, we'll do it just once more. Um, so the, the, the context here is an employee uh, needs to pass on something to their boss or another employee. And we'll, we'll say they work in an office setting. Okay, this is sort of an employee and sort of like an insurance company or maybe a publisher like that. Um, and um, they, uh, they might, for example, be presenting uh, some, some data in a, in a meeting and sort of talking about why it's relevant. Um, but they also might come across this data in reports, sort of internal reports or, or memos. Um, so uh, in the, in the um, uh, have your say uh, box, uh, I'd like to see if, what other ideas you have for this particular context. What other kind of sources of data might uh, someone be asked to, to uh, relay or process? Okay, again, we'll give you a couple of seconds to write your answers. I can think of a lot. <laughs> I'm just thinking of work, the different sources, <laughs> text sources that I receive. Great. I call it multi-texting. You know, they say multitasking. <laughs> what about multi-texting? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's part, of, part of our life now, right? Part of every day. It is, absolutely. Absolutely. People are saying a chart. Okay. Yes, definitely, definitely lots of charts in that context. Um, oh, reviews, that's sort of interesting, yeah. Reports. A meeting, the, the minutes of a meeting. I wonder about that one. That could involve data, sure. You know. um, I think that would sort of be closer related to sort of note taking, maybe. But it, but it could involve some 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 explaining of data. For sure. Ah, budget, great one. Great. Yes, report with right. search. So, um, the return to work. There's a very there's a lovely. I've got to sorry. I've got to say this. The the <laughs> return to work process after the pandemic. Yeah, just understanding like <laughs> what's coming. <laughs> yes, yeah, for sure. 
Uh, okay, so just a, a, some of the ideas that uh, I was I was sort of coming up with: um, surveys, maybe flow charts. Uh, somebody mentioned market research. Yeah, bar charts, pie charts, graphs. That kind of thing. Okay. So uh, we've talked about sort of three types of mediation, and as I said, they are different when you think about it. And I think it's worth thinking sort of when you're teaching a uh, mediation tests, like what type of mediation is this? Like what do the actual students have to do? Uh, because I think that sort of helps you sort of uh, pinpoint maybe some of the strategies um, that the students are going to need in order to do that task successfully. Um, it also helps with assessing, I think, um, sort of have they, have, did they sort of understand what they were supposed to do and, and have they done it? So at this point, we're going to move on uh, to talk about sort of some just some classroom ideas uh, for adding more mediation. Um, these three types of mediation that we've just looked at uh, into our lessons uh, using sort of just a little adaptations of the book or, or sort of classic um, classroom activities. So um, first one I'm going to focus on is receptive tasks. Uh, so course books um, like the Macmillan English uh, Hub series are full of uh, great texts, right? Like listenings or, or readings. Um, that are essentially receptive tasks, uh, where ask students to listen and understand. Them. And then, of course, there's always like a, a speaking part where they get to sort of give their own opinion about it. Uh, but I find, uh, in my experience at least, um, it's, it's been really easy to find a great text in the course book and just tweak it a little bit to add uh, that sort of productive side um, of the mediation task to turn it into a mediation task. Because um, that's the part that's sort of missing when you think about it, sort of the part where you have to think about who uh, what you need to what you need to relay um, from the um, the text and who who you're going to be sort of relaying it to. So one good example of that is a, a reading task uh, like this one. This is taken from the, the B two uh, English Hub book, and um, yeah, it's a, a typical reading. You know, we 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 get the students to do some prediction, some scanning, um, and then uh, we're then we get them to do some reading for detail. As well. Uh, so you could just do this as a normal task uh, and then add mediation, uh, or you could actually just replace this sort of reading activity uh, with a mediation task, uh, like this one, for example. Um, so this particular task is about um, sort of ways to live longer, basically sort of tips for living longer. And uh, you could turn that into a mediation task, uh, in this case a relaying specific information task, um, by just getting students to sort of scan the article and uh, think about, yeah, which of these ideas might actually explain why Spanish people seem to live for so long. Um, and I think you'll find that some of them are definitely not relevant and uh, students will sort of be able to discard them quickly. Uh, one of them is moving to Japan, <laughs> is one of the tips. Um, obviously, uh, that's not why Spanish people uh, live so long, because they moved to Japan. Um, so you can sort of easily find uh, some, some, um, some ones that would actually possibly uh, relate to why uh, Spanish people live uh, for so long. For example, a healthy diet. Um, the diet in Spain is very good. Um, just to go off on a tangent for a minute, I was actually reading in The Economist the other day um, that uh, Spanish people are going to be the longest living people in the world uh, very soon uh, because uh, Spanish people keep living longer and longer and uh, Japanese people live longer than Spanish people now, uh, but they're sort of they're sort of losing ground and Spain is sort of gaining. So uh, well, well done for having such a healthy diet and um, sort of a good culture. They were saying actually one interesting thing they were saying is that uh, one of the key factors in Spain for longevity is uh, the close relationships that Spanish people have with their friends and family. That's, uh, that makes people live longer, uh, which I think that we can all say is true here in Spain. Like you guys have uh, a great relationship with your families generally. So, uh, sorry to go off on that tangent for a minute. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, another example of the same type of uh, activity. So, you have a reading text. Uh, in this case, it's um, basically two people uh, debating about um, how social media is sort of affecting our relationships. And, um, and then we have, you know, a, a reading task. Um, and in this particular case, I wanted to point out um, that um, uh, the, the reading tasks in, and also listening tasks in the English Hub series are very interesting because uh, they sort of go beyond just sort of reading comprehension. Uh, in this case, uh, we're um, having uh, students look at uh, underlying assumptions that the writers are making, um, which I, it's, it's nice. It's sort of a nice kind of transferable skill. We've been talking about mediation, but uh, I think the English Hub series has sort of included a lot of other sort of soft skills, critical thinking and things like that. So that's uh, really nice to see. Uh, so you could do that uh, reading task, of course, um, and then you could add the mediation task onto it. 
Uh, or, as I said, you could actually just replace it um, with a mediation task where the students have to, um, in this case, uh, summarize sort of the main ideas uh, for somebody who hasn't read it. Um, also, maybe adding their own opinion about how social media is changing relationships. Um, <clears throat> because actually, when you move up higher in mediation, um, the person uh, who's uh, doing the mediation um, has a little bit more sort of is expected to, to do a little bit more. They're expected to sort of analyze things, um, sort, of give, sort of be a bit more active in the process of, of processing of uh, what type of information is passed on. Uh, so uh, this would be obviously a written mediation task. Um, and uh, I was just gonna say that uh, every time I see sort of two texts in a course book, I always, like my mind always goes to some type of jigsaw activity. You know, I think it's just a great opportunity to get students um, to doing a little bit of extra interaction. And so you could do that in this case. So for example, you could have a, a student, um, one student reading the article on the left and summarizing it, and another student reading um, the article on, on the right and summarizing it. And then they could sort of exchange their summaries um, and sort of talk about um, you know, why they, they chose this relevant information to include in their summary, et cetera. Um, and I, this is another great uh, opportunity um, to point out the fact that uh, sometimes mediation doesn't doesn't um, involve that type of linguistic barrier that we're often we often talk about with mediation. Um, in this case, we just have a, a text that someone hasn't read um, and uh, is going to sort of benefit in, in a sense from 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 just knowing the the key ideas in it. We're sort of training students um, with this uh, very valuable skill of summarizing. I just want to point out that. Um, <laughs> Uh, in this case, uh, actually, actually, I sort of got mixed up. So the one before is actually a spoken mediation task, so they're sort of summarizing it in speech. Uh, but also, you could change this into a written mediation task, and you could have students write the summary um, instead of, um, of saying. Uh, as I said before, I think that often um, a spoken and uh, written mediation task are sort of interchangeable in the sense you could sort of choose which way to go depending on uh, which type of mediation you think your students are going to be uh, most benefit from. So uh, one final idea, uh, sort of uh, to turn a, a, a receptive task, like a reading task, into a more, uh, more of a mediation task. Uh, this is one of my favorite activities. Uh, I love this one. Um, it's uh, basically um, a take on this idea of the running dictation. I'm sure we're all familiar with this one, where you sort of have a, a list of sentences on a wall, and then students have to kind of go back and forth and sort of remember what's, on, what's written there, and then... And, sort of copy it down word for word. Um, another student is, of course, doing the writing. So in this case, uh, we're sort of making that a little bit harder, a little bit more challenging, um, by asking students to summarize a text. Uh, so there's a text on the wall that one student goes uh, and reads, and then they have to go back and sort of explain the main points to a person who's sitting um, and writing um, and uh, who has not read the text, of course. Um, so it's a nice way of sort of getting students out of their seat in a mediation task. Um, it ends up being a very, very engaging task. Uh, one thing I was going to mention is that uh, it's good to keep the text short <laughs> for this particular activity. Um, it, it's, it's, it can be a bit challenging uh, to uh, summarize a much longer text um, if you only uh, have the ability to just kind of read it and go back um, instead of sort of taking notes and things like that. So anyway, you can, you can experiment with this idea um, uh, if you want to. So I was going to say that uh, we've been talking about sort of creating a mediation task uh, sort of out of um, one of the texts in the course book. And I thought it would just be um, useful, uh, just from my own experience writing this type of task, uh, just to talk about sort of what type of information is good to include in the task instructions if you're going to sort of write these instructions for your students. Um, so uh, there are five things that I think are important. I think there has to be a context for mediation. I think there has to be a source text and a target text, as we've mentioned. And I also think that the target audience has to be clear. We sort of have to know who we're talking to, um, because that's going to sort of give us an idea of the formality uh, of the language we're, we're going to use and, and what information is actually going to be relevant to them. So uh, this is not a, a have your say activity. I just want you to do this yourselves in your head. Um, so I just want you to quickly read the instructions for this particular mediation task um, and just try to locate uh, the source text, the target text, and the target audience. So I'll just give you a minute to do that.
Okay, so I imagine this was pretty easy, so I'm just going to advance the slide to show you. Um, yeah, so obviously the, the source text was the article, the students are writing a blog post, um, and uh, they're writing that blog post for other students in the class. You know, this is uh, one of those class blogs that I've, I've created for, for my students, um, or a place for them to put their ideas together about uh, maybe a topic they're studying in class. So yeah, so maybe just keeping those, um, uh, sorry, I, I said five and I meant, uh, I was too. I, I meant to put uh, one more, which was a uh, communicative purpose. Um, I think that got missed out. But <laughs> anyway, uh, the fifth one that's not there is communicative purpose. Uh, so you sort of have to explain um, what the person is is supposed to uh, communicate and sort of how they're supposed to communicate it. Um, in this case, um, we're summarizing the main points of the blog. So um, let's uh, move on to productive tasks. So we were talking about how we can use the course book uh, essentially with just a very small sort of change um, in order to give students um, practice with, um, uh, with, with, with text mediation. And I think the same is true uh, for productive tasks. So we're talking about reading and speaking. Um, so if you see a reading or, uh, sorry, a writing <laughs> or speaking task in the course book, I think those are often um, easily adapted to become a text mediation task as well. Uh, and basically what we have to add in this case is the receptive side. We have to sort of get them listening to something, get them something, reading something before they do the speaking or, or the writing. And I think this is very natural, possibly even more natural than, than the ones that I was talking about before. Uh, because when you think about it, when you look at a writing test like this one, as comes from the C1 um, English, uh, Macmillan English Hub. Um, so we have students writing, um, uh, they're applying for a job, um, a job that they want. Um, their dream job. And they give you some options, an astronaut, a zookeeper, um, a stunt performer. And it's an engaging task, you know, getting students to sort of brainstorm, well, what kind of skills do you need as an astronaut? Or what, kind of, what kind of qualifications do you think a, a zookeeper has? Uh, that's a very interesting sort of classroom discussion uh, to have. Uh, but I think that one thing that can add to that classroom discussion uh, is a sort of a brief kind of receptive stage uh, where students just look for some information related to that. So for example, if they're interested in, in becoming a zookeeper, uh, if, you, if you Google that, you come up with uh, interesting websites immediately. Um, you know, there's um, some information about, yeah, oh, so you want to be a zookeeper? Well, what, what do you have to do? And there's even sort of job requirements from, uh, this is called the National Careers Service Center. Uh, this thing is easy for students to find, actually. Um, and, and obviously, um, in Spain, I think we can safely assume a student is going to come to class with a mobile phone or a tablet. So just giving them a few minutes, uh, maybe five minutes or something before they do the discussion um, to, uh, to find some information, some relevant information. Um, and then, of course, they're going to relay that information, specific information, um, into this uh, piece of writing that they're going to uh, create. In this case, it's a, a letter of application. And um, I think the same thing is true uh, for speaking tasks. Um, so this is a, a nice um, sort of speaking hub task. By the way, these, these sort of come at the end of a unit uh, typically in, in, in um, the English um, hub series. And I think they've done a particularly good job with these uh, speaking activities. I, I've taught this C1 book and I, I like this part of the book. Um, and um, yeah, you can see here, they're, they're, we're gonna have sort of a debate about things. Um, <coughs> we're gonna... Um, debate the idea that all vehicles should be banned from city centers. You know, so if students are going to be in different groups, they're going to be discussing this. Um, and again, it's, it's a great classroom discussion, getting students to, to brainstorm some ideas, some arguments to make. Um, that's what we would sort of typically do in, our, in, um, in class. Um, but again, giving students a little bit of time uh, to find their own information related to the topic is, is great. I think it's particularly good for a debate. Because when you think about it, if somebody's sort of debating or making an argument and they actually make reference to some data, for example, like according to this study by you know, Harvard University, immediately you're like, oh, that sounds convincing. <laughs> um, and uh, so I think sort of it helps you make uh, yeah, a more convincing argument, uh, particularly in this type of speaking activity. But, but really, anytime you're doing a uh, speaking activity, the more you know about the topic, the better you're going to be able to talk about it. And so I think that, yeah, being able to sort of process a uh, text, maybe a, a YouTube video that you watched about the topic, uh, or some, or sort of explaining some data related to it. Um, it can enhance that activity and uh, turn it into a mediation activity, right? Sort of a spoken mediation. 
And um, so my second to last uh, activity uh, is a very simple one. Um, so uh, we often get students to discuss things in groups and clubs. Um, and I think that that activity itself uh, can be a text that students could work with. Because as we said, the idea of a text is quite, quite broad. It could be a written text, it could be uh, yeah, a, a, a news report or something like that, but it could also be a conversation. A conversation could be a text as well. Uh, so if you put students in groups and have them discuss a topic, uh, you could have, actually have one student whose job is to take notes um, on sort of the main ideas uh, that came up uh, during that, uh, that discussion. And then uh, you could, of course, uh, after in a second stage, you could have them sort of swap places with a person from another group. And they could uh, sort of process that text for them. They could sort of summarize that, those main ideas. Um, and, and at least in my classroom, this has been a nice uh, sort of engaging classroom activity because um, it ends up sort of leading to some, some comparison as well. So the people that are sort of receiving that um, information, um, that summary, often sort of comment on it or they compare it with what they said or say, oh yeah, we thought of the same thing. Um, it's a sort of a nice way of including a little bit of uh, mediation, um, working with those uh, skills, uh, those mediation strategies, of sort of summarizing, um, note-taking, uh, these sort of skills that we associate with mediation. And uh, <laughs> it's worth pointing out that uh, you could actually do this um, in a cross linguistic way as well. So the first part of the uh, the first task was to discuss something could actually be in Spanish, uh, or the first language of your of your students, and um, and then the second part could be in English. So basically, they're sort of taking notes on the conversation that happens in Spanish, and then the second part is in English, and they're sort of summarizing that that the main points from that uh, discussion in English. Um, so because they're working with that that. Um, that uh, mediation skills of translating, um, which is often relevant um, in a mediation context. So uh, my final activity uh, is called uh, genre transfer. Uh, so uh, it's sort of taking the idea of text mediation a little bit far uh, in a sort of a creative way. Um, but uh, basically, one thing I've had my students do uh, is uh, basically takes a certain type of text, like an essay, and change it into another type of text. Um, so I've, I've had luck, I've had good luck sort of with essay to, to blog post or article. Uh, because I don't know about you, but sometimes uh, students don't really know the difference between a blog post and an article. Um, and this can be a nice way of sort of raising uh, their awareness of those differences. Um, and um, when you think about it, this is text mediation, when you think about it, because um, students have to read the essay and sort of identify the main ideas. Um, and then they have to sort of rewrite those main ideas for a new target audience, sort of thinking about a new person is going to read it. Because the same person, you know, a tutor or a teacher reads an essay, but a blog post or an article has much wider uh, readership, um, you know, if it's on the internet or whatever. Uh, so you'd really have to be sort of thinking about, yeah, what, what information from this essay is really going to be relevant uh, for sort of this larger sort of audience um, that's going to read it. And um, also it sort of gets you using adapting language, which is another uh, mediation strategy as well. So uh, those are just uh, some ideas that uh, if you haven't already thought of, uh, uh, you could try out in your classes. So um, I'm going to finish there uh, right on time. I'm just <laughs> very happy about it. Uh, so <coughs> um, I want to finish with a, a one last have your say activity, uh, which is I just sort of curious uh, which activities um, or ideas from this, this webinar uh, do you think are going to be interesting and sort of useful to you that you might actually sort of try out in your teaching context? Great. Well, thank you very much, Jeff, Ethan. I was very complete, very thorough. Um, mm -hmm. It was interesting to yeah, look at, first of all, what's involved, uh, what types of texts, types of situations. That was very interesting in a real life context. And then um, what's involved, key um, strategies involved in mediating those texts. And then um, the practical ideas of which there were quite a few and some which I hadn't thought of. So I found that really quite novel and thank you for sharing those ideas. And uh, yes, uh, so- I've been an aviation enthusiast for a while, so I've, uh, I've been kind I of experimenting. Classes I can see that. <laughs> okay, so we'll see, let's see. Um, lots, <laughs> there's quite a few people saying lots of interesting ideas, difficult to choose one. There have been a lot of ideas, absolutely. And people, of course, like all 
webinars, when you attend a webinar, you take notes, for example, but you also receive a handout. We're going to send you a handout after the event. Um, you need time to process, don't you, as well, the ideas. But I think they're, they're very applicable and quite easy to put into practice. Um, you can see there are more. I don't know if you want to comment a couple of them. Yeah, I was just saying that people like the idea of uh, sort of summarizing the two different texts. Um, course books often sort of have texts that are in different sections. Um, you can actually do this with a listening text as well. Uh, it's a little trickier to manage in class, but you can have students that listen to one part of something and other students listening to another part. Um, uh, again, it's, a little bit, it's actually really easy to do online if you're teaching online, but a little bit harder in class, but uh, it's possible. Um, yeah, somebody liked the right. idea of uh, using listening text and converting it into a mediation activity. Um, I think it's uh, often uh, pretty natural, actually, um, to sort of make that, that transition. Yes, there's a comment that genre transfer could be diff difficult for lower levels for B1 level students, but the speaking and text mediation, the two texts and discussion, they think they're great. I don't know if you want to comment on that, the genre transfer. Yes, that, that's something I've done at higher levels. I probably should, I probably should mention. Yeah, I, I think that's a good one for, yeah, maybe B2, strong B2, maybe C1 student. Um, they can do that task. I've done it, at least my students can do it. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, for, for a lower level student, that might that might be challenging. You might have to, I think you could still do it, um, but I think it might require some scaffolding for sure. Um, you'd have to support yes. students, I think, at lower levels. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, adapting, somebody has made a comment, adapting information from local pupils to foreign pupils. Okay. Yeah, well, yes. I wasn't sure about that. I, was, I wasn't going to comment because I didn't quite understand. Uh, somebody could elaborate yeah. on that if they want. It's an idea. It's an idea, perhaps, that they're adding okay. or sharing with everybody. I think that's what it is. Okay. Um, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that very interesting talk. And now we can spend a couple of minutes answering questions that people may have. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, you have a Q&A button, and there you can put your questions or comments if you wish. Um, some of you may have already done so, but please be, feel free to do so now. Um, and there is a question which would be interesting to address. And I, I was thinking about it as well myself, Ethan, during the, during the, the, the event. We were talking about reading texts. Um, but um, of course, texts, could also be audio visual, Definitely. listening, there could be video, etc. Um, so these ideas, could you comment on that? Do you think these ideas could be applied to these other kinds of texts? Definitely. Definitely. In fact, there's a, so there's a lot of great um, video in the, the Macmillan English Hub series. Um, I really like the, yeah, I think they're called the video lessons. Um, I've used some of these as my students. Yeah. They, they're basically sort of taken from, yeah, I think the Guardian and other sources. And uh, yeah, you exactly. can definitely uh, the same type of activity. You could get students to watch it, take notes on sort of what they perceived as being sort of the main ideas or the main messages. Um, or uh, you could get them to listen for something very specific, you know, like maybe a friend is interested in this activity. Um, and wants to know sort of how to sign up for it, how much it costs, um, and you can get them to listen and, and sort of make note of that specific information while they're listening to it. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that's that's one really cool thing about mediation is that sort of the, the variety and the and the sort of possibilities are almost endless um, for sort of combining uh, source text with 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 um, target text and sort of mixing and matching. Um, there's really a lot you can do with mediation. It's cool. Yes. Okay. Okay. And um, there was another question as well related to videos, but I think you've you, you've answered that. And um, there's so much material. I think I think the point that you've made um, quite clear is that you have to be clear about what you want to do, don't you? You've got to have a clear objective. There's an awful lot of material. We've got a lot of material, but what do we actually do with it? And to, mm -hmm answer that question you've got to have clear learning 
um, and teaching objectives, don't you? And yes. um, I think you made it quite clear in the kind of tasks, but maybe you'd like to expand a little bit more on that um, in the tasks that, that you showed that having clear objectives, I think um, both for yourself, but also for the students and communicating that. I think that was a point that Monica made last year. She said that, you know, um, bringing the students on board, not assuming that they know exactly what you mean, but um, sharing the objectives with them and giving them the support and breaking the tasks down and giving the support and the scaffolding and all of that. And obviously that the scaffolding is particularly important at the lower levels, but it's still important at, at the higher levels as well, to a certain extent. It's making, I suppose it's, it's it's making it's making the tasks accessible or it's designing yeah it's designing tasks that are relevant but then it's staging them so that they are accessible and that they have clear you know the students can come out thinking okay i know where i am with this maybe i need to work more on something maybe i need to or oh wow you know actually i did quite better than I thought I was going to do, you know, uh, and that's very important in terms of motivation. Anyway, do you want to comment? And then yeah, no, I was just, uh, I, yeah, I've watched Monica's uh, webinar. I thought it was, she did a great job of, yeah, uh, looking at, yeah, uh, sort of the importance of, of uh, yeah, scaffolding mediation tasks. I think particularly um, perhaps for students that uh, are still finding mediation maybe a new skill to practice in class. I think you have to sort of scaffold in, you have to sort of scaffold maybe a listening task a little bit less because they've done so many now. But uh, mediation is still pretty new. So I think, um, and I think that you make a good point about breaking up the task as well as something that uh, Monica talked about. Um, and I think that's easy to do in a mediation task because you can sort of take the receptive side um, and sort of break it off from the productive side and have like a, a, a bit in the middle <laughs> where you kind of do a little yeah. checking. You know? So for example, if it's a relaying information task, um, you could uh, check that they have actually identified the most relevant information. Um, they have actually found it. Um, and then, then you could sort of move on to, well, how do we pass this on in an accessible way to this particular person? Um, and uh, yeah, um, how can we structure that particular target text? Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a natural thing to do within a mediation task. It's, um, yeah, so yeah, breaking it up into, into 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 sort of sections and um, giving students help along the way yeah great idea yes okay thank you and um there's another question from maria dolores about um do you think it is better to give the task instructions in english or in spanish it's interesting um i've actually long thought <laughs> that um it's fine to give students instructions in their first language, actually, because uh, especially at lower levels, talking about lower levels, because um, really, if you're teaching like, yeah, the present simple or something, uh, and you want them to do a present, an activity with the present simple, that's the goal <laughs> is to get them to. And, and sometimes at lower levels, actually, the instructions you give, you actually use language that's sort of above the level. It's sort of hard to avoid sometimes, you know? Um, so I think actually giving students instructions in their first language makes a lot of sense uh, at lower levels in particular. Um, and I think that's, yeah, um, I think you'll find that, yeah, most of the instructions on the exams that I've written uh, for the ministry and the ones I've seen from different communities, I think they nearly always have the instructions in English. I might be wrong about that. <laughs> um, obviously, mediation is yeah. um, being used for different languages as well. I know that in some, some communities, they're actually creating mediation tasks that are then sort of use for different languages. And I think in that case, they may be putting the instructions in Spanish. Um, I personally have no problem with it. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, that's, that's, that's just sort of my opinion. That's, particularly if you're working with a monolingual group of students, obviously if you have students um, that are not from originally from Spain, um, that sort of complicates things when you're asking them to mediate something from, from their first language. Um, but that type of multi, 
lingual group, I think it's probably better to stick to sort of intra-linguistic mediation where the target text is in English um, and then the sort of the production stage is also in English, um, which many of the tasks I showed you from the course book would sort of fall into that category. Um, so, yeah. But I think um, it, often those mediation worksheets that I showed you, the, 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 not all of them, but, but many of the texts, the source texts are in Spanish um, because they were created specifically for the Spanish market. Uh, but I think you'll find that, um, I think they're often like a good inspiration. So you could sort of take the instructions and you could go find a different text to work with. Um, the internet, as someone said earlier, is full of, full of useful text. Um, yes. So I think that um, obviously those have been very carefully written uh, so that they could be sort of assessed very carefully and stuff. Um, but you can make kind of a rougher version yourself uh, if you wanted to, um, if you're working with multilingual uh, classes, um, they, would, they would work. You know, just fine, I'm sure. Actually, Maria Dolores says that she meant the task itself. Ah, the task itself, like the the uh, the source text. Is that what she meant? Yes. Means? Yes. I see. Yes. I think. I, I think. I think. I think. I think it's really cool to work with uh, Spanish texts in class and get students to talk about them in English. Um, because like if you ask students, they do it all the time in their real lives. Like, you know, I've, mm -hmm. when I do mediation stuff in class, I often start with this type of brainstorm activity just to get them thinking about it. And uh, yeah, I've had so many students say, yeah, I do this every day at work. <laughs> you know, I, like I have lawyers for sort of uh, firms that have foreign clients and stuff. And they say, oh, yeah, no, I have to read contracts in English and then explain them to my customers. You know, I do that all the time. You know. Uh, Doctors do this all the time. They read uh, like research in English from a journal and then they explain it to their patient or, or other people at their hospital in English. Um, you know, this, moving between two languages like that is um, a transferable skill in itself. You know, it's, it's something that I think mediation has sort of highlighted uh, that's uh, a good thing to bring into class because if students are doing it all the time in their, in their normal lives, uh, surely we can help them get better at it. Um, in our classes. Exactly. Um, if we speak the students' first language, um, I, I speak Spanish because I've learned it, but you know, many of you speak uh, your students' first language as a mother tongue. And uh, you know, so you're in like the perfect position to help students uh, improve that, that set of skills. Excellent. And yes, I think everybody in this webinar, including ourselves and the technical people behind the webinar, are using mediation skill, skills on a regular basis as well, as we've been doing today before the webinar um, <laughs> and, and, and in preparation for the webinar. So hmm, it just affects, as you say, it's developing real life skills, isn't it? Um, They're very and it's transferable to all areas of life. So thank you very much, Ethan. That's been wonderful. Um, don't I mean, you, you, your camera is going to go off now, but you're not going to disappear totally. Yeah. I want you to come back at the end. It would be nice for everybody to say goodbye at the end. Um, so thank you once again. And now I would like to introduce my colleague, um, Lucy Thistlewaite. Hello, Lucy. Good morning, or is it Hi, good Louise. afternoon? I've lost track of the time. Um, good. How are you? Lucy Good. Is a, yeah, I was really, a, really enjoying the webinar. I've been taking notes and um, yeah, yeah, and it was interesting to hear people's feedback on, on what they thought. I, I, I had my exactly. own favorite activities, but it was great. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I'll leave the floor to you. I will shoot off, but um, only for a short while. And we'll see each other or everybody will see each other at the end. OK, over to you. OK. Thanks a lot. See you in a bit, Louise. Thank you. OK, hi, everybody. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Macmillan English Hub. I mean, I've really enjoyed uh, listening to Ethan for the last hour or so. And, you know, I'm, I'm in contact with a lot of Escuela Oficial teachers um, and I, I get a lot of feedback and, and speak to people all the time. So it's really interesting to hear these practical ideas and things that, um, that are, are great ideas to be putting into practice. 
Um, I was actually taking some notes. I really like the dictagloss activity. It's something that I used to do when I was teaching, but uh, I hadn't thought about it in terms of mediation. And one of the thought, things that I thought from the, the session was how adaptable mediation is a skill, um, as a skill, because really, as teachers, we're, you know, you're always uh, thinking, well, this is the new skill that's come out and we need activities for it. But really, Ethan proved that just by using any of the activities in the book, we could turn that around and uh, and use and add the mediation skill to it, really. So I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, which Ethan mentioned, which I found fascinating, was, was how much he admires teachers um, and uh, how inspiring you all are with how you've got to grasp with mediation. You know, I, I remember a couple of years ago uh, when it first came to light that we, we, you know, it was going to be included in inside the the curriculum. It was a, all a bit of a shock. So what do we do now? You know, this is this new skill, and it's very true that you know most teachers are, are really getting to to grips with that now, and it, it it is inspiring. So well done to you all. Anyway, for for all of us, it's fantastic to have um, new uh, material to use for these mediation. And so I think with Macmillan English Hub, we really uh, have a, a lot of mediation support in there. I'll be telling you a little bit towards the end of, of this little mini presentation. But I really wanted to let you know um, some of the key features about Macmillan English Hub. And more importantly, some of the, the feedback that we're getting, you know, uh, it's been a couple of years that some teachers have been using this this series that we have for Escuela Oficiales. So the best thing about that is we start to receive feedback. People tell us what they think about the, the book and what's really working for them. So I'll be telling you not only about some of the key features, but also about um, some of the feedback that we're getting from from teachers, which is which is great. OK, so first of all, if you don't know the series, um, the the objectives are very clear and coherent throughout the unit and throughout the whole book so obviously they're stated in the contents page at the at the beginning of the book like all textbooks but we really want to kind of focus students and teachers on the objectives of each unit and, and even of each page throughout the book uh, this just kind of keeps keeps everybody on track you know sometimes we get lost in in what we're doing in a class and, and are not focused on what we're really trying to achieve here so with Macmillan English Hub at the beginning you see these beautiful unit own openers that we have uh, within the in the first page of the unit the objectives are clearly stated here and you can use this as a kind of checklist you know you can go back at the end and tick have you reached those learning objectives do you feel confident uh, about them or maybe do you need a little bit of extra work there? And you know, you can look at that. Maybe you didn't go to that class. So this is great for both students and teachers to keep on track. Also, um, every page has a kind of header. Um, and in those headers, you've got your, your objectives there as well. Again, keeping you on track. What's the what's the objective of this class? And I think that's that's a, a really important point and a key feature of the, the series. Um, uh, this is where we come into to talking a little bit about the feedback. Now, teachers are really, really enjoying this teacher's book. We have an interleave teacher's book, which has on one page the student's book and on the other page the, the teacher's book. Well, that means you don't need to carry around two books, which is uh, really great, but it also has fantastic ideas, methodological ideas for, you know, unit openers, warmers, coolers, um, little games you can play but also all the practical things like underlining where the listening, where the answers are for the listening and filling in obviously the answers there. So it's a really great uh, teacher's book that teachers are telling that they, they really like this. Um, okay, we've also got the, the teacher's app, uh, which is obviously your, your presentation kit, all your resources, you have this offline and you can also use the browser. So whatever's more comfortable for you in your situation. And uh, it's just a kind of all-in-one digital place to go. It has the test generator in there, which is specific for the book. So you have unit tests and um, end, of, uh, end of term tests, things like that. But it also has an EOI-specific test generator. So this test generator um, has EOI-type exams in there, and you can use this one as well alongside the other test generator. 
Um, again, going to feedback, um, the communication, the speaking um, activities in Hub. Uh, I think Ethan mentioned this and, and how you can use these as well to be to be mediation tasks, but it really is packed full of relevant and meaningful speaking opportunities. Okay, I think when you open the book, you'll see how up to date it is. This is one of the really nice things about having a new series um, is that you can have really up to date, modern reading, speaking, listening activities. And the communication hub and the speaking hub are a part of this. However, don't forget when you're using the book, even in the grammar, reading, vocab sections, there's always opportunity to speak. Um, I think most adult students go to class for these opportunities, so we don't want to miss these opportunities, and you'll feel that they're packed full of that. Apart from that, we have these speaking cards, which come at the end of the student's book, and these are perfect practice for the monologues, okay? So if you're in the Escuela Oficial and you have to do uh, monologue practice, then you give, get a lot of tip topics and some sentence starters and ideas for how they can express their ideas. And these are great for using either at the beginning of a class or, you know, warmers uh, or fast finishers or just little groups. And they're, they're really useful as well. Um, Audiovisual content, it's packed full of, of video content um, now. One of the great ideas that we have is with the, the, the cafe hub, which is at the end of the unit, it kind of culminates everything comes together into a kind of motivating, productive activity um, where the students get to use everyday functional English. This is really important um, practice for them. It not only gives them practice of what they've learned on this double page spread here, but also bringing in everything from the unit. Um, it's a video lesson, so it's all based around a video where they get to watch a uh, like a mini Netflix series with different characters, um, but then they get to put into practice this uh, this activity, use some of the language they've learned themselves in a productive skill. Um, so it's a really lovely task to to bring the the unit to an end. We also have audiovisual support for authentic English, so the Guardian videos. Um, I think in the Escuela Oficialis, you have to expose your students to, to real English, to authentic English. You're listening to my, my uh, chats to teachers in EOIs always tells me how uh, authentic English is, is a really important part of, of your listening material. So we have uh, the Guardian video for every unit. These are motivating documentary style uh, videos. And I think, uh, you know, teachers and students find these really great. And obviously they're very scaffolded depending on the needs of the, the level. Okay, so um, moving on with the times, we obviously have to have an app that goes with this. Uh, this is a, a really fantastic on the go practice uh, app. It doesn't just give you, you know, support for grammar and vocab, but you can also practice the skills, listening, reading, and also writing and speaking, which is, uh, which is great for, for something that you're doing at home. Teachers have the opportunity to link up with their students, see what they've done, check what they've been doing and, and, and monitor their progress uh, if necessary, if that's something they want to do. So that's also uh, a great thing. We're finding this is a much more motivating way of doing homework than, than maybe the old fashioned workbook. So um, the workbook has its place. It's really good as kind of consolidation of what's been doing, being done. But this is a, kind of this continued support is, is a really motivating um, tool. Now, moving on to the uh, support that we offer for linguistic mediation. Um, I think when we brought the book out a couple of years ago, uh, it was very important for us to include activities for every unit for both interlinguistic and for intralinguistic, which some of, you know, Ethan's been using some of these examples today, okay, both obviously for spoken and writ written practice, um, and whether it's in English or in Spanish, we've got plenty of activities there at every level, every unit. Um, and it was also important to kind of offer rubrics to, to understand how to evaluate the students on this, on these mediation tasks. So you'll find rubrics uh, uh, that we've offered for all of the levels as well. Now, you can find all of these activities in Macmillan Advantage. They're also in the Resource Center on the, in the Teachers app. But if you go to Macmillan Advantage, which is our 
uh, premium users website where you can log on and, and find all sorts of fun activities. Um, you can find the mediation activities per unit. Now, as time has gone on, we've seen, you know, needs changing. Not only do the teachers need uh, activities for, for doing in class, but also for assessment. So, you know, we're moving with the times and we've put some new material up there in the last year or so um, for assessment. So uh, if you're assessing mediation, many teachers were telling us that they needed exam type tasks, but also model answers. So we've put these, these uh, activities also in Macmillan Advantage. You can see that we have here a, a speaking mediation task. It's also using an info, uh, infograph, you know, which I think is quite a common exercise. And these are editable, which is really important because some teachers tell us, you know, I like it, but it, I really like the fact that I could edit. Some comunidades have different word counts. Um, you might have specific needs for that particular class. And so these documents are all editable as well. So you can change them to meet your specific needs. We also have the, uh, in the, um, the model answers here. You get a sample answer with examiner comments, which I think is fantastic. Um, you know, with it being such a new skill, sometimes we don't know where we're going. And if we're doing it right, both teachers and students, to have these model answers really helps us uh, know that we're on track. Um, so just to summarize here, we've got the students' material, what, what material uh, you can get. It's obviously a completely flexible approach. Everything is available in the traditional paper format, but also digitally. So if you have students that prefer to buy a digital version, they, they have that option. If you buy the paper option, you automatically get option, uh, access to the student's app. Um, so make sure they're logging on and using it. And for teachers, obviously you have your resource center, your presentation kit, your digital, your workbooks. And new this year, we have an e-planner. Uh, one of the feedback that I hear so many, it doesn't matter what textbook is being used is, you have so many things on your plate, you know, other things to include in your classes that sometimes you don't have the option of finishing the book. Now with the e-planner, um, you can select and do your own programmation online and select what you want to do. And this is a good time to spend, maybe spend some hours at the beginning of your course and selecting which are the most relevant and important parts to cover for your course. Okay, so that's a new thing. All right, so just finishing up there, um, I hope most of you have got samples of, of this book already. And if you don't have samples and you'd like to see the series, please do get in touch with your Macmillan representative. And if you don't know who your, your rep is, I'm very happy for you to get in touch with me and I can help you out, whatever you need. Okay, so just coming to the end there, I don't know if Louise is around at all. I am, I'm back. Didn't go Hi, far. Louise. That was great, thank you very much. Very complete, very thorough. The course has um, so much excellent material, you know, audio, visual, reading, productive, the integration of skills, authentic material. And those um, Cafe Hub situational yes. videos are excellent and great models yeah. and very accessible, I think, in a kind of yes, format that people easily relate to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. There's something for everyone there, I think, you know. There, there really is. is. There really is. Yeah. It's great. And I wonder where Ethan is. Shall we invite Ethan? We'd like you to come back on, please. Um, thank you. For, it's great to have all three of us together. Great. No, fantastic. So, thank you, Ethan. That was wonderful. I think as well, like Lucy said, um, I was taking, I wasn't taking, well, I did take a couple of written notes, but I was taking a lot of mental notes. And actually, I'm going to um, look at your handout, definitely. And I'm going to watch this this um the, the, this webinar again because um the ideas were really 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 helpful i think i like the approach um it was i don't know you, you your approach to looking at what's involved and then the pla practical application was excellent and i think it's been a, a lovely development today of our webinar series on mediation over the last couple of years and as Lucy said, you know, when it came up first, mediation, everybody was in, oh, what's mediation? How? And um, we had that kind of initial kind of panic um, moment. But um, I think 
both of you, and I think over the webinar series, we've made it clear that mediation is actually something that we do all the time. It's so relevant to real life. And now it's just kind of um, working on it more explicitly in, in, in the classroom, isn't it? Making it more visible. It is there in so much of what we do already. So Absolutely. thank you for that, Ethan. And thank you, um, Lucy. And thanks to everybody out there for joining us, for taking the time out of your busy schedules. Uh, we will send you an email, more or less, in a week's time with the certificate of attendance and the handout for this event. And now what we'd like to do is launch the Survey Monkey questionnaire. It will appear as a button on your, your screen. Please complete it. There are questions in there about um, the event, the talk, um, also about uh, the time of the event. And there are questions on uh, where you can give your opinion or suggestions for future training sessions and topics to cover. And if you would like to hear more about Macmillan English Hub, uh, there is a question there that you can tick yes, and we'll get in touch with you. And at the end of the questionnaire, there's a link to the Macmillan English Hub uh, website as well, if you would like to find out more. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks, Lucy. And thanks, everybody thanks, out there. All the best with the rest of the, the, the course. See you soon, hopefully. Bye.